Welcome. You're listening to the Good Girls Don't podcast with Ashley Ray and Verity Mansfield. This is the podcast where we smash those rules that we've been taught to follow both as men and women and burn the damn rule book. We're tackling the big issues and the issues nobody wants to talk about and we'll be fiercely feminist about it. This podcast is about inspiration, education, compassion and being the change that you need to see in this world. This podcast is for the trailblazers, the freedom fighters, and the soul igniters, and all the women just like you who are ready to break the good girl rules and be heard. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of Australia and its First Nations people on which this podcast is produced and consumed. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Get ready for the revolution. Hey, Ashley. Hi, Verity. Are you excited about today's episode? You have no idea how long I've been waiting for this to happen. (laughs) This is one of my favourites. They're all favourites, obviously, but some are more favourite than others. (gasps) (laughs) I won't tell anyone if you don't. Uh, Because we got to talk to someone that I have been hankering for you to connect with and someone that I love so, so much in person and online. And I'm so in love with the work that she does. And I'm just so excited for what everyone's going to hear in this episode. Yeah. I think it was so fascinating because while I had a rough idea about what Stasha Washburn does, um, you knew so much more. So you were so juicily waiting to jump into this conversation. Um, And I was really fascinated because I was so, I'm like what I guess a lot of our audiences will be feeling, wasn't really sure what was going to come up. Um, so we've been speaking to Stasha Washburn, um, who is known as the period coach. Do you want to elaborate more on what Stasha does? Abso-fucking-lutely I do. <laughs> well, abso-bloody-lutely. <laughs> so look, I, I'll share a little bit about, you know, my experience with Stasha as well. And you'll hear that throughout the episode, but basically here's what you need to know. Stasha is a certified holistic health coach. She's got 20 plus years of research um, that's fueled her passion to reconnect women to the power of their cycles. And when we're talking about cycles, we're talking about periods. Um, She's here to end the taboo of menstruation worldwide. It's not a big deal to her. It's just, you know, small goal. It's what she does for breakfast every morning. Stasha is changing the conversation around periods from whispers in the ladies room to empowered public discussions. Stasha spent 20 years searching for a way to relieve her endometriosis. And in the process, she discovered how to help women balance their hormones through both science and woo woo. Knowing this, she could no longer keep it quiet or keep it a secret. So she became a speaker using her voice ever since to bring relief to women worldwide. I've got to say, I came across Stasha a few years ago, um, sort of by accident through, I don't know if you guys ever do this, but through like a Facebook group, like everybody seems to have a group and people were just talking about this group and I joined it and she has the most beautiful Facebook group. I've learned so much about periods from there and I've done one of Stasha's programs as well, which is about balancing your hormones through diet and lifestyle her work's really powerful. I used to have the most horrendous um, cycles. I'd be doubled over in pain. I would, I wouldn't be able to function for three or four days a month, every month consistently, basically since I was about 14. So her work is really, really important. And I think of some of those things as well. Like, you know, even if we haven't had horrendous periods, we've all felt the shame around our periods. We've all been embarrassed if, you know, it's leaked. Um, we've all been shamed, you know, especially by, you know, men who say stupid things like, oh, you're obviously on your rags or, 
Um, remember how we talked as well about that quote? Yes. Uh, never trust something that bleeds for five days and doesn't die. Like there's so many shitty taboos about periods and, you know, it makes us as women like disconnect from our bodies. We're so disempowered um, by our periods and it's, it's yeah. so wrong. Like our periods, and this is what I loved about Stasha, was this concept of that, how we can actually learn that our, our periods can actually empower us instead of diminish us. Yes, amen, hallelujah, hallelujah. It was so good to have that, you know what, when I got my period, I wasn't taught anything about it except that it was going to come every month and I needed to wear like a tampon or a pad and that was it. No one explained to me about cramps, about PMS, about hormones. Like no one talked to me. And I think this came up as well. None of us know what a healthy period looks like. And I think this was such a brilliant conversation because when you listen to this this episode, you'll totally understand how disconnected we've all come from our bodies and this idea that, you know, it's through our menstrual cycle that we can kind of heal things and we can, you know, sort of have this measure of our own body about where, how healthy our body is functioning, um, at, you know, at that, you know, during that whole month. Like oh, yeah. Fascinating conversation. And even like talking about the pill and the damage that the pill does to us and, and this concept that literally from, you know, becoming fertile and having our periods to, you know, being in the coffin, our bodies are constantly like medically, um, like a hormone regime is completely... It's been controlled by Big Pharma. It's a conspiracy. <laughs> it's just... I don't know if it's a conspiracy. It's just what is. Like, it's just we're, we're dependent on hormones. And I think it's so hilarious because we live in a world as well where we're all about organic and you know being healthy and looking after the environment and none of us will make sure that there's no like hormones in our chicken but we're ramming them down our throats like yeah and they're all artificial none of them are natural yeah it's so crazy so i think this was such a brilliant episode it was so juicy it was so um it was so meaty like it was you just wanted to sink your teeth into it it was i loved it there's also an amazing part of this episode that really, really stuck with me. And this is about working with people in different communities. So Stasha supports um, different causes through her business. And one of them is one girl and that how they support people really, really stuck with me. So it's about making periods less of a taboo, but also empowering women who live in communities that where maybe the taboo is so strong that it literally places them in physical danger. And how do you help these women menstruate safely? Oh yeah. Yeah. The, the days for girls charity or foundation, absolutely brilliant. And you know, their slogan was uh, turning periods into pathways. And I just love that. I just love that idea of being able to help educate um, you know, all women, you know, regardless of their, you know, um, economic status. And it's just brilliant. It's just such a beautiful, beautiful episode. And I think there's something for everybody in there. And even like as a mother of like daughters, how do we empower our children? How do we create a different a story for them where, where they're not going to grow up with shame around their bodies or around their periods um, and, and how are they going to find more empowerment, um, you know, from their body and from their, their periods and be friends with their bodies. And stay tuned to this episode because there are some really beautiful practices that you can take up the whole family, get everybody involved um, I promise it does not involve painting each other's faces with period blood. It's not that kind of a practice, but there are some really gorgeous things that you can do as a family, um, whatever your family looks like yeah, that gets everyone involved and educated about what's going and on. Men, like, you know, Stasha even talks about ways that you can bring men into the conversation about periods. So it doesn't become this taboo thing. It becomes something that we honor and something, you know, that we um, have respect for. It's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Awesome. Stay tuned for this all coming up in just a minute.
Welcome to the Good Girls Don't podcast, Stasha Washburn. How are you going? What? what? Hello. Stasha, you're a period coach. What does that even mean? Yeah, so I go about the world spreading the good word of blood. Yay! Um, actually, a big part of what I do is attempt to reframe periods for women. It's a taboo and... Um, it's one of those things that we have all of these thoughts and ideas and opinions about, but it turns out most of us were terribly miseducated and not through our fault or even our educators fault, but just the long history that got us here. And, uh, yeah, we're just in need of a period revolution. So Basically, what I'm doing is re-educating in a way and just sharing with women what really is happening, what's really not happening, what's supposed to happen, what's not supposed to happen, and just reframing all of it. Okay. I think we might need to take a few steps back for people Mm because there's going to be a lot of men and women listening to this who are going, hang on, what do you mean, how did we get here? How did we get here? (laughs) What is here even? What does that translate to? Yeah. So one of those examples would be that, you know, your period is just a curse. Cramps are just part of being a woman. PMS is just what happens. Mood swings are just what women do during their periods. All these kinds of ideas of these negative uh, or just inconveniences of periods when in reality, that, that's not true. They're not supposed to be painful. They're not supposed to be problematic. They're not supposed to be full of mood swings and binges and terrible, terrible things. Those are actually side effects of this misinformation, right? So when we think that these things are normal, we don't realize that there might be something going on that's actually fixable and that you can actually have a peaceful, harmonious relationship with your cycle. That said, we got to this place because of the taboo around women and menstruation and kind of all things womb related, though more and more those barriers are starting to come down. Mm -hmm. Um, But I I really do believe the final frontier here is periods. Um, But yeah, so we got here through a lot of things, the patriarchal religions, the way that uh, men taught periods or re- even refused to look into periods or even teach about periods. Um, the witch hunts that went on in uh, Europe and then, of course, spread around the world uh, through you know, imperialism and religion and these kinds of things um, really separated what women knew. So there was... A history where it was just part of life and women, you know, had their own rituals or gathered, had red tents, had moon huts or lodges or just gathered or whatever it was, all sorts of different things. But it was a part of life and it was accepted and women helped each other out. And if there were problems, they were like, oh, eat this herb or whatever. Like there were answers and solutions and the community came together and helped. Mm -hmm. And then as those patriarchal religions uh, and communities rose, that wasn't so much allowed. And eventually it just became a woman's issue. And the community at large didn't understand it, didn't have any connection with it. And it was really segregated. And I imagine that at one time women went to the red tents thinking, oh, yes, I can't wait. This is like three days with the ladies. The men are in charge of the village. Like, we're just going to go kick it and relax. It was a good time. (laughs) And eventually it turned into like a banishment process. That makes a lot of sense. We hear about that a lot in Western media. Yeah, we do. And, and you see that as that process. But, you know, those, that's not how they started. They didn't start as a banishment or a punishment. They started as, I'm sure, women skipping down the street with a basket full of cookies going, me time. Sounds like a really uh, twisted <laughs> PR campaign. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, our history has a way of turning things that were once good into terrible, terrible things down the line. So yes. And you know what? It's not like this is unique. <laughs> yeah. And that taboo, I think really continues today when we see things in the media. Yeah, I, I blame the media for a lot of things with how they <laughs> pray things, but 
there's a particular thing that stuck with me when I first started getting my periods when I was young and it was watching uh, the South Park movie and there's a line in there that says, uh, don't trust something that bleeds for five days and doesn't yeah. die. And that line stuck with me and really yeah. embedded that whole, okay, you can't trust women. Yeah. And that's yeah. Mm-hmm. really, really powerful in a yeah. not great way. Yeah. And, and that's part of, you know, that's part of those witch hunts and the, that progression of, of making it go from something that the entire village, men and women understood at least what happened and how it worked. And, you know, that this was, you know, it wasn't a good or a bad thing, depending on, I suppose, if you wanted to get pregnant or not, but it wasn't like an overarching judgment call. But we went from this, the whole village got it and, and participated in whatever ways. I mean, even if women did take time for that red tent or just to go and have their period in, in community, that meant that the men had to know that was coming, that they had to do something. Someone had to, you know, take care of the village, watch the kids, whatever it was. Even if the kids came with you at some age, I'm sure they didn't anymore. So there had to have been some community aspect between everyone in the community uh, or the village or whatever coming together in support and then turned into this banishment process and turned into this negative thing and evolved into this. And you see it with the witch hunts and the trials. And I mean, it took hundreds of years and it took millions of deaths, but Mm -hmm. you see where women started you know, pre this time, women did help women. There were herbalists and midwives and women who did this work. And then there wasn't after that because those hunts specifically called out midwives and it women. literally killed them off. Healers, yeah. Very specifically called those women out or men as well, but it was mostly a woman's uh, tradition or, or job. Mm-hmm. But it called them out specifically and it eradicated that knowledge And then by default, you know, women who gathered were a coven. So women no longer could gather. And then they were just basically trained that your value is your husband. You have no external value outside of that. Now you can't have friends. You can't have community. You can't have sisters because that's dangerous. That leads to the potential for torture, for loss of life, for loss of land, for not just you, but you behind. It it literally becomes a, I have to do what I have to do to survive. It is. It's a survival mechanism. And this is one of those things that I think today we're fighting on some kind of genetic level because we know trauma's handed down. So there's mm-hmm. a study on the Holocaust victims and their survivors and their children, and their grandchildren and, and whatnot. So we know that trauma is handed down. We know that it sticks in the genes. We know that a lot of anxiety and stress and debilitating chronic illnesses come from that handed down genetic uh, programming. Mm-hmm. But Women are also programmed to tend and befriend, right? Our stress response is not necessarily flight or flight, fight or flight. It's tend and befriend. So we have a stress response that genetically wants us to go find our friends, to link arms and battle together. We knew our strength was in our community. We knew that to the point that that is our stress response. And then over generations of hunts and and tortures and trials and and murders and public vicious murders, we learned that we couldn't gather in times of of celebration or stress. We couldn't have it. Because you'll be hunted down. Right. So now we have this genetic conflict that's all happening, not even on a conscious level, because we don't have this information. So I see even just in community where women are struggling to have community and have that trust and have that, that I've got your back mentality to it, but then also struggling with that programming of you can't trust something that doesn't bleed for five days and doesn't die. So we have a really big conflict that's just in ourselves on this level. And then when you're asked to go into something even deeper, a taboo about 
our periods. So now we're asking you to go against these two conflicting genetic things. And we're asking you to not only do that, but to also get over a taboo that says, no, no, we don't talk about this. This isn't proper. This isn't something we talk about. It's a really tough subject. So it's, this is why I say my job is really just to travel around and re-educate and educate and just talk because that is the very first step is just to talk, put it out in the open, speak the words publicly, verbally, use the correct terminology, have these conversations. You know, I've got to say on that note, you were the first person who educated me about my period. So I had been to doctors when I was a tween and was developing, going through puberty, and they had tried to explain it to me, but I couldn't understand it and I didn't know how it worked. And the way it was all men explaining this to me, who were telling me every 28 days on the day I was going to start bleeding for a few days. And I just couldn't understand it. And I didn't understand it until I came across your work and the way that you have it laid out as seasonal Mm -hmm. and really getting into the energy and emotion that is going on with you at any given time is a really beautiful way. I think a much more feminine way of figuring out your period and what normal is. That's my Yeah. Well, it's hard to connect to something that you have no experience with, but when you look at it as, as you're going through a, a season, summer, fall, winter, spring, every month, you have some kind of idea. Like, I know what that is. I know what that feels like. I know what winter feels like. And then when you go, okay, well, if your menstrual phase is winter, oh yeah, I do like to snuggle with hot tea under the covers during my period. Oh, I do like an extra serving of cocoa during my period. Okay. That makes sense. Like when you start to think about how those phases of the cycle relate to the seasons, you have something that makes sense that you that, that you've un, you've felt before and that you can tangibly put it together. And then you can actually start building and start putting those things together. But it's hard to build off of a foundation where you, you have no foundation. Yeah. I remember yeah. seeing all over uh, Dolly and uh, Girlfriend and even Cosmo and Cleo uh, when I was in my later teens that the only way to sort of know where you were in your cycle was because your hair, nails, and skin would suddenly, you know, be absolutely stunningly beautiful. And that meant that you were in ovulation and that, that was it. That was the baseline. And then it was like, well, okay, if you notice that's happening, you're probably going to start bleeding in about two weeks time. Yeah. That was it. That was the only way that I was sort of educated at the time to know when my period was coming. Yeah. And at least you had an idea of ovulation. I can't, I stopped counting uh, the women who didn't even know of ovulation, didn't realize that your bleed during, say, when you're on, on the pill, that bleed isn't actually a period, that, that there was no ovulation that happened or that ovulation even existed. So it... <sighs> To be fair, you knew more than some, <laughs> most even. <laughs> only by a smidgen, only because I religiously bought those magazines for those little bits of nuggets I could find yeah. every couple of months. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes there's a, it's it was a nugget a of shocking gold. Amount of, yeah. Shocking amount of disinformation. And then when we come across a little bit, it's, well, it's that taboo. It's like, oh, I know something I probably shouldn't know. <laughs> exactly. You know, the, the sealed section was my best friend in high school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How did you become the period coach? Like this, I'm I'm assuming you didn't just wake up one day and you're like, periods, this is what I'm going to (laughs) do. This is my life. (laughs) This is it. This is it. I'm assuming that there was something of a journey for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yeah. I mean, I started out of the gate as a teenager with really painful periods. And at the time, the prevailing medical uh, standard was that You couldn't, it took years for endometriosis pain to develop, so it couldn't be endometriosis. And it didn't matter if it was because there's no treatment or cure for it anyway. So they just did the same thing they would have done for anybody. And they put me on birth control, which Mm -hmm. didn't work. And knowing what I know now, it doesn't work for most women who have endometriosis. In fact, it doesn't work for most women that have any hormonal imbalance because it doesn't balance your hormones. So it actually doesn't fix any of those problems anyway. But side rant. So uh, 
I just, I had to figure out something. And in high school, I was on birth control. I was in some on birth controls that were experimental, that were recalled because just too many women died on them. Wow. Uh, and women die on all forms of birth control. So it had to be a lot of women that died on that for them to recall it because all of the forms that are out there now, women have died from. That's so. amazing. Yeah. So it was, yeah, it was... Um, it was intense and I was on prescription narcotics because none of the painkillers worked. So we, we worked my way up to prescription narcotics. So I joke sometimes that if I had an addictive personality, I would be doing very different work now because I'd have been hooked on opioids as a teenager. <laughs> I'm so glad uh, you did that. No, no. And I'm really thankful. I say this a lot in, in interviews. I'm very thankful for the parents that I have and, and for, you know, my mom and dad being very cautious with those kinds of things. And my mom making it very clear, like, these are very addictive. You're only going to take them if you need them. This isn't something that you're going to need except for during your period. And yes, you know, you can have them during your period, but that's what they're for. They're not for like a headache next, you know, next week or a sprained ankle or something. This is for this. So it really didn't, it, it really did help keep, you know, that kind of, I guess, watchdog of, of myself even just to go, okay, these are addictive, make sure. But they didn't really help with the pain. So I really didn't see a whole lot of point in taking them because ultimately what happened is I would just fall asleep from them. And then I would just have dreams of being in pain. You know, I'd have dreams where I was being tortured or dreams I was being stabbed or like I just had dreams about having the pain. So I still was in pain. It was just, instead of being conscious, I was unconscious, but it was still painful. So it was like, why am I even taking these? Like yeah. they don't, they're not doing anything. So, so, so yeah, your, your um, pain was that bad that you were on these highly addictive drugs. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, I've heard you say before that you used to vomit and pass yeah. out a lot. Yeah. So I was on all of these things that didn't work. And ultimately what happened is I would get my period, like the week before I would get my period, I'd be really brain foggy. I'd sleep a lot. I, I couldn't, like words were hard. People interacting with humans was hard. Getting, standing up was hard. And then right before I would get my period, it, I would oftentimes pass out. Like I, I go sheet white lose all of the color on my face and, and body. And I'd break out into a very cold sweat. And then I'd very often collapse. Uh, I do remember in live, I lived in Brooklyn clinging to a subway pole at one point, just thinking you cannot pass out on the subway. This is the most filthy place on the planet. This is not the place that you're hitting the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, and just like clinging to the cold steel subway pole trying to keep conscious but um but in high school and in uh, in other circumstances I mean I just went down uh like a ton of bricks and I'd wake up in other places sometimes I, I woke up in the nurse's office one time in high school and I realized what was going on I, I realized you know that was okay well and now I and now I woke up I would often have my period so I then the next two, three days would just be in the bathroom, throwing up from the pain, cycling between a scalding hot bathtub because it helped with the pain and then just succumbing to it and throwing up and, yeah. and then being back in the tub and I couldn't eat, you know, I could maybe suck on an ice cube at best, but you know, sometimes it's better to have something in your body to throw up than nothing. So I kind of went that route a little bit, but it was really a, a horrific experience and that's going to be, uh, you know, it's one of those things that, yeah, it is because you go, Oh my God, I'm going to live through this. I'm going to have to do it again. Yeah. If I live even that this, I'm away, have it's to do like it in another three and a half weeks time, we're going through this again. Yeah. It was unpleasant to say the least. And over the years it got to be really, <sighs> so exhausting that there were times that I'm now thankful for throwing up because there were definitely times where I was like, I'm just going to take this whole bottle of pain pills. What's the worst that can happen? I don't wake up and I never have to do this again. So I, there's definitely, there were definitely times that I was sobbing on the floor of my bathroom or in the tub and just wishing for a hysterectomy, wishing that I had health insurance so that I could have a hysterectomy or wishing that I could, something would happen, you know, to just end this. And, uh, it was, it was unpleasant. So I, I spent all of that time trying to figure it out. You know, I, I read, 
uh, about Ayurvedic healing in like 2002 or 2003. I wow. remember when Deepak Chopra was a big thing. Yeah. Deepak's first book came out, Deepak Chopra's very first book, an introduction into Ayurveda for Western society, basically. Um, and I gobbled it up, hoping that this would be the thing that helped me figure it out. I went to acupuncturists, which to be fair, they did help, but I couldn't afford the amount of consistent treatments that I needed to, to deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, I went to acupressurists, herbalists. I mean, I, I did all sorts of things. I, I tried everything in order to deal with it. And, um, and it was actually ultimately years down the line that I went to school to be a health coach because I'd finally realized, like, I can't have a job that makes me go to it, especially because I was a dancer and a bartender and those physically demanding jobs. But even like a desk, I was like, I, there's, not, there's no way I could get up and go for a week every month to a job. So I've got to figure out how to make a living that doesn't involve going to work. And I was teaching yoga and dance and Pilates. And I was like, everyone keeps asking me about healthy recipes at the studio. Maybe I should just be a health coach and work with athletes. I was a dancer. I have a dance degree. I work with athletes. I was an athlete. So it was actually doing my health coaching certification that I learned. I started to put together what I had spent those 20 years researching and all of these different food theories that I was learning and these different ways of dealing with stress and dietary things, all the stuff that I learned in coaching mm -hmm. and started to apply to myself that I started to put it all together with a singular focus of how can I stop my cramps. And it actually started to work and it, and it started to change and I started to have pain-free periods and I started to have periods where I could actually function and do things and it started to work. And that's when I was like, oh, I am onto something. And then of so course, all of my athlete that. clients had period problems and I was able to fix them really easily because none of them had endometriosis. And then it just all sort of rolled into one day talking to one of my best friends and she, we were talking about how the taboo was the problem. There's no studies on women. All the studies are done on men. There's no research on periods or period problems. All these doctors who told me it couldn't be endometriosis when in fact I'm a classic case of endometriosis. Like they just have no education because there's no studies, there's no information, and it's all because of this taboo. And I needed to go, that's the root of the problem, right? Just like as a health coach, you go, what's the root of the problem? You don't have a birth control deficiency. There's a hormonal imbalance. What is it? How do we fix it? What's the root of the hormonal problem? I realized the root of the big problem was the taboo. And she was like, well, you should just call yourself the period coach. Bust the taboo right in your name. And I was like, Google is the URL, theperiodcoach.com available? Yes, it is. Done, bought, business. I love that you just went on and bought the domain. I love that. It took like maybe two minutes in real time. You know, and that's like, what, 20 <laughs> years of building up to something uh -huh. that took two minutes to do. Yeah. Well, that's like when people talk about overnight successes. I'm like, there is no such thing as an overnight success. There's that one thing that maybe went viral but there's a lot of years behind the scenes that people don't know about. <laughs> exactly. I even remember, okay, I remember the Backstreet Boys doing an interview about that and saying, hey, everyone thought we were an overnight success with our first hit. But what they didn't see was literally the 10 years of vocal lessons and performing practice that they had leading up to that. Mm -hmm. I love yep. this Nick Carter. Oh, anyway. <laughs> well, back in the day, back when yes. he was really, really cute. Um, I hear you. <laughs> can we talk about the symptoms of shitty periods? Yes. Because I suspect that there's going to be quite a lot of women listening to this who are like, well, no, my period is fine. I don't have a problem. It's a little painful or discomforting, but yeah. I mean, what is the baseline for a, I suppose a good, normal, healthy period yeah. versus a shitty one? Yeah, it would be easier to tell you what a healthier period is than to tell you what all of the things that can go wrong are because it's a very long list of things that can go wrong. <laughs> but a healthy period should be bright red, should not have spotting, 
should not be longer than seven days. Now I'm saying that with a little asterisk because there's not, you could have an eight day long period. It's not the end of the world, but I would want to know like how much blood you're losing. And, 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 you know, we would need to talk about some things in that case. Right. Okay. But it should be about five to seven days. It should be bright red. You shouldn't be soaking through a super tampon or a super pad in a matter of an hour or two maybe three in a day, but it shouldn't really be more than that. It, it's, these are the things that it shouldn't be painful. It shouldn't be exhausting you to the point that you're sleeping all day long. A nap? Sure. Yeah, absolutely within the realm of normal. Some discomfort that you can have a glass of ginger tea or hot water bottle? Fine. Within the realm of normal. But something that you need to drug yourself for, something that's causing real pain, real headaches, real cramps, back aches, all of those things not within the realm of normal. So it really shouldn't be this debilitating curse in any way, shape, or form. It should be actually like, oh yeah, I feel a little bit more tired. I don't really want to talk to as many people, but otherwise, yeah, no, I'm pretty good. Should be normal. Okay. That's what you're looking for. All right. That's what we're looking for. I have a question to add in there. So for a healthy period, we should, okay. okay, in theory, based off what you've just said, I'm gathering that we should still be able to uh, go to work or do whatever form of work it is that we do, whether that is going into an office space or coaching, whatever kind of work it is that we do. It shouldn't impact us or stop us from doing that. Is that about right? I'm going to say that with a, an asterisk. Yeah, that's, that's the majority is true, but 10% of women have a diagnosed endometriosis and endometriosis takes about 10 years to get a diagnosis, which means 10% is probably just a fraction of the population that have endometriosis. Um, PCOS, the, there's, there are issues that we have that make it harder for you to deal with them and still just go about your day as normal. And even for somebody who could go about their day as normal, I would like to see giving themselves some extra time, giving themselves some extra grace, as we call it in my community, like give yourself extra grace on these days. Mm -hmm. uh, because some things happen, like uh, slip, like dropping things. It's the drop seas phase. Like that's normal, and that happens, and that happens to all of us. And it's not a sign that something's wrong or that there's a hormonal imbalance or anything like that. That just kind of happens. So, like extra grace is definitely within the realm of normal. And for a lot of women who work a desk job a nine to five, yeah, it should be okay. They should be fine. But that might mean like. Those are the days that they call into work an hour late and take a little bit longer for breakfast and just getting themselves together. And that's not a bad thing. And that doesn't mean that you're doing anything wrong or that anything is abnormal. That's just kind of it. And especially now when there's more flexible jobs and there's more jobs to understand it. I've had uh, women who work at jobs and they, they actually can get a couple of flex days to work at home and they just go, look, I could get more work done by just staying at home and working remotely today than if I come to the office because I'm using that energy to get dressed, take a shower, get there, be and there, fun. interact with humans, right, be a normal person, but they could actually get everything done at home or, you know, that taking the extra hour to get in in the morning and then going, okay, but, you know, in two weeks, I'm happy to stay an extra hour late. So a lot of times, especially when I'm talking to corporations, I'm saying look at a woman's productivity over the course of a month. Let them come in for an extra hour if that's a possibility, oh, right? That's really fascinating. Yeah. So instead of the 40-hour work week, I would rather see the 160-hour work month. So really expanding how you look at time. I'm not going to say that I got that math 100% right right then, but <laughs> looking at again. that time, you know what I mean? So like looking at that time and looking at the bigger picture of things and really seeing that... 
it's not minute day to day, but in that bigger picture. And yeah, most women can go to work and be normal and have no problems and that's perfectly fine. But a substantial amount of women can't need a little grace, need a little extra help, need that hour, and then don't need to be popping my doll in the break room because they just, well, they just needed an extra hour to get into work that day. You know, those little things. So I say yes, but with asterisks. I have a sneaky suspicion that for employers out there um, who are more flexible with their female employees who, you know, whether it's for periods or for childcare reasons, I'm, I've got a sneaky suspicion that the women who do work for these people probably going to be a lot more committed to the role maybe get more done, be more productive for them. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it results in a higher yield or profits of some description. It does. Woo-hoo, I think we're yeah. onto something. It does. There's a lot of companies and even some small countries that have been trying to figure out how to create this in their business, in their businesses, in their companies and their corporations. And I'm not saying that we've got the ideal model even created yet, but people are trying and they are seeing some positive results. They're seeing some negative results too. They're seeing things that don't work, but they are seeing some positive results. And I think that this is just one of those situations where we don't stop just because it's hard or maybe we did get some negative feedback, but we go, okay, but then what do we do instead? And how do we, there's a way to make this work for everybody and still honor what's happening in our bodies and our, and our Absolutely. minds. Absolutely. I'm really excited to see the 40 hour work week completely dismantled. Cause I really think it hurts um, everybody, men included. Yeah. It does. It does. <laughs> I can't wait for it to go. Cause then, Oh, I'm just excited about what's going to happen next. Mm-hmm. So I know, me too. for this to all work for us to be able to take those flex days or a little bit of extra time out for ourselves. We kind of need to know when our period's coming. So Mm -hmm. how do we know that? How do we work that one out? Yeah. So we, I mean, we chart and there's a lot of different options for it. There are a lot of apps out there. I don't know about any of them and I can't give you any recommendations on any of them because I am a staunch pen and paper charter personally. Um, a lot I of say that aimed at uh, babies as well, like knowing. Yeah, it's it's about how to make a baby. Yeah, yeah. There's some that aren't. There are some that are there that have like tips and things, which is helpful. But at the end of the day, um, we know a few things. We know that we don't retain knowledge that we enter into apps, but we do retain knowledge that we write down. So you know, I have a coloring mandala where you just kind of color in symbols, and they show you what you mean, so you can see everything. We know that you retain that knowledge more than an app. So when you go into your doctor's office, for example, and they go, when was your last period? You have to look at an app. But when you're actually using like my mandala or even just a pen and paper, you, most women go, oh, it was, you know, X amount of days ago because they know because they they're writing it down. They're actually looking at it. They're actually making that mind body connection. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's just an example, but there's a lot of other things that come up. Um, and we know that we that when something is telling us what's happening to us, we're taking out our own feeling, our own knowledge, and our own responsibility and our own control. We're giving control to an app when in reality, we just need to learn how to trust ourselves. So when we write these things down, we start building that relationship with our body. We start seeing the patterns and we start going, oh, this is what this feels like then that means tomorrow is going to feel like this. And you can start anticipating and you can start actually knowing what's coming next. So when I sit down to chart, I look at it and I go, okay, well, this is where I'm at. Oh, I've got about a week before I'm going to be in my luteal phase, the the week or two weeks before your period, after you ovulate. And I'll go, okay, I'm going to be in my luteal phase. I want to make sure that good grocery shop in before then, because I'm not going to want to go out and interact in, with the public so much during that time. So I'm going to go make sure I do a big shop this week so that I have everything I need for next week home and here and ready to go. So you can start making those kinds of like little life choices much better 
when you're charting. The other reason, or at least another big reason, is that you can't see everything on an app. So when you're looking at an app, you can't see how your food affected your mood, how your digestion re resulted from what you ate, how your uh, cervical fluid is showing up. You can't see how your energy is impacted by these things. You can't see it all. But the charting, especially the mandala that we've created, you can actually see everything right there in front of you and you can see month after month after month right in a row, clear as day. So you can really see how everything affects each other and those decisions that you make. You have a lot more control. The downside is, and this is where I see a lot of resistance, is now you know. So you, you make choices more knowingly and it's a little bit harder to claim ignorance. <laughs> yes. It's a lot of personal responsibility, isn't it? Yeah. And that's where I see a lot of resistance is because when you are using an app, you, it's something else that, that that thing failed or that thing, you know, it's an outside source. It's going, well, the app told me that this is what's happening. So it's what's happening instead of going, well, but I feel like this. So this is actually true. Um, or seeing it on your chart and going, well, I know that when I do three days of caffeine in a row, I get a migraine. Like I... That's just okay. I know that now about myself. Now I have to make the choice of if I'm going to get a decaf or not. Like you, you do have to start making some real, you, you, you have the knowledge. So it's, it's a bit of resistance because it's harder to keep your head in the sand with uh, real charting. <laughs> it's one of those things. It really is. I think it translates across so many different fields. It's like once you have the knowledge it's what you choose to do with it because then it really does become a choice whether you yeah. engage with it or not. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, I tell women in my free community all the time, like if you haven't done anything and you just feel like an app is the only thing that you're going to do, then just start there, at least start. And then hopefully, and, and I've seen this progression happen in a lot of women. They do the app and then they start to realize that they're depending on the app. And then like, we'll get a story in the Facebook community where like somebody's app lost all of their data and now they have nothing. And then the other women will go, ah, oh, you know, I have been meaning to move into that charting on paper thing that Stasha is always talking about. I, I'm going to let that be my wake up call and start doing it, you know, or or somebody will post about a realization that they made by charting on paper and go, you know what? I never would have put this together on my app. And so you see that progression where you get started and then you see some other examples too. So whatever gets you started, I'm all for. So I love this because it's starting with where you're at because not everyone is ready to jump head no. first into a full blown mandala. And yeah. I know that's certainly not where I was ready to start. <laughs> Yeah. I came no, and even with the mandala, I'm like, don't start with the whole thing. Just pick three symbols and start with those and just get used to that and make it part of your routine. Like I brush my teeth, I climb into bed, I pull out my chart because it's on my nightstand and I color it in. That's my routine. Some women do. I wake up in the morning, I take my basal body temperature and then I roll over and I chart from yesterday. I do what, you know, everything from yesterday and I do that chart. So Whatever that routine is, you just you start to build it into your routine, and then you can add more in as you get comfortable with it, as you get used to the symbols that you are using, and you can just start to add as you go. So even when women start with that paper chart, I never recommend start with the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> start with a couple, get used to it, get used to those symbols, and you can add on as you go. I have to ask, we're talking a lot about, you know, grown women here, but... Mm -hmm you know, can we introduce this for our teenagers, our, our daughters who are just coming into, oh my God, I'm bleeding. Yeah. Even before that. So I have a lot of moms who started using the chart and because the chart that I do, that I have is free and you can print out a million copies. You can use them endlessly because this is just how much I believe in it. Um, they'll print out a bunch of copies for their kids. And so everyone will sit down at coloring time and color in the mandala and their symbols just mean different things. So like where mom's cervical fluid goes, it looks like little drops of water. 
But for the kids, it's did we drink a healthy drink today? Did we drink a glass of water today? Did we have a glass of you know orange juice today or whatever uh, that particular family family does? Or you know, did we? did we have an act of love within the family today, right? So for the heart, which for us would mean libido, maybe it would mean if you're using a condom or not because you're trying to get pregnant or not, like all of those different things that you could use that heart symbol for, for us, for the kids is, you know, did we say I love you to my sister today? Or did we do an act of service for my family today? Or did I, you know, did I do my chores, right? So they kind of do that same thing where the kids are using it. And then as the kids get older, then mom starts moving them more into like, okay, you know, you know, even before they, a woman, a a teen gets her period, it might be like, yeah, at some point you're going to start tracking this and this is actually where your period is going to go. So they start to have those conversations, which is so healthy for our our kids because a lot of those conversations don't happen in school and if they do happen they're done very wrong poorly ill-informed so it's really just a good way for moms to even have that precedent set and frankly the younger you start the easier it is to do that so absolutely you can and then for teens they're going through a hormonal flux and most doctors put them on birth control to deal with their irregular quote unquote periods. Oh, my GP did that to me. Yeah, but that's your hormones will settle. And the more you're charting and the more you're realizing what's going on and the more you realize the food and then sleep and energy levels and how those impact those things, the quicker you'll actually get into a rhythm. So it's, it's, you don't need birth control. That's not what the problem is. The problem is just getting your ovaries to be working in rhythm and tandem with the rest of your body. And that takes time. And they're, you know, they're misfiring and sputtering and sparking and turning on. And that's just part of the process. And putting them to sleep with birth control, which is what it does, it puts you into a state of menopause, is skipping from, you know, 13 to 55, with none of the in between. That's not healthy. <laughs> wow. No, it really is not okay for a teenager to that's just starting. I mean, their body doesn't even get a chance to try and regulate itself. No, they don't. And it can take years for that regular rhythm to start happening. So, you know, and frankly, it's not like it should be birth control for teens anyway. They should be using condoms. They're in STD land and they should be using condoms anyway. So (laughs) (laughs) of course, it's not like put you on birth control because you shouldn't be using condoms. You should be using condoms anyway. So (laughs) side rant once again. (laughs) (laughs) That's totally okay. Now we did have a question from Verity's daughter, Olivia, and Mm -hmm. she really wanted to know if chocolate really does help with PMS? It can. There's a lot of truth in that whole magnesium and minerals in chocolate thing. So crappy chocolate doesn't help. Okay. So no calories. Yeah. But real chocolate can help because it's, if it's processed well, it retains those minerals that we, that we crave so much. And in fact, I would even posit the theory that having a nice, rich, dark chocolate with a minimal amount of sugar added to it before, like if you're charting and you know, oh, I'm about to enter my PMS time, which is not a phase of your cycle. It's a hormonal imbalance. But if you go, okay, this is normally when I feel those PMS symptoms, I'm going to start having a hot chocolate before I go to bed or a couple of squares of this really good chocolate beforehand, you might actually even be able to offset some of those symptoms. That said, I also highly recommend adding in a lot of good fiber, a lot of good fats, and a lot of water as well before that happens because those also really help ease PMS symptoms. (laughs) Oh my God, yes. I did your food and flow program, what, 2018? Yeah, 2018. And, you know, I wasn't ready to do a full-blown diet change, but just learning, okay, I've got my period, I keep craving chocolate, 
and it was about the magnesium and all of that because I just needed that. So I, you know, previously I just used to reach for, I mean, block upon block of the crappy chocolate that we all love. It's full of sugar. Um, you know, the Cadbury's marvelous creations was a favorite of mine. <laughs> it still is, but instead I went out and I bought like a packet of, uh, the powdered cacao mm -hmm. and I started making myself a really, um, I think it's fancy. It's not that fancy, but for me, it's like a really delicious once a month treat that I have when my period comes. And it is the most wonderful feeling. I don't know what it is about the cacao, but it really is an act of self-love, self-care and nurturing. And it's like a hug from the inside out. And it just makes such a difference mm -hmm. in how the rest of my period goes. <laughs> Well, there are some out there who say that raw cacao vibrates on the same vibration as women and that it's just that very connected. I mean, if you look at a cacao pod, even it's like, wow, that is yoni, yoni licious. It's just very <laughs> it is, isn't it? womanly. It's full of seeds, the, the cacao seeds and yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of women who do cacao ceremony in that sacred process, and they talk about the connections between cacao and just women kind. Um, but I, I mean, also from the science perspective, it does it is full of those minerals that we don't get enough of. I don't know a single woman who has who isn't suffering from some level of zinc or magnesium or selenium or vitamin D deficiency. And not to say that those are all in cacao, but cacao does have some of those elements to it, some of those minerals that we need and we're not getting it. And it's just, it is, it's like a hug from the inside because it's filling in that void and that need for those minerals mm. that we really need to work for our bodies to work properly. So and it really is amazing just the difference some small tweaks make with mm -hmm. how your cycle goes as a whole. Like mm -hmm. I remember you saying, Hey, you know, oh, crikey, I cannot remember the precise time of month it was, but you were like, you know, a handful of berries, mm -hmm. you know, with, with breakfast can make a really big difference. And I remember going, okay, well, no wonder I'm craving prawns at this time of my period. I really want them. It's that time or salads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's do it. And, oh, God, it feels emotionally like really good to satisfy a craving, <laughs> but also your body yeah, starts to don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And the body just starts to feel a hundred times better than it did, you know, a few days before. Right. And then fan. you don't have such extreme cravings because you're giving your body those things that you may not even know you need. In fact, one, that's one of the things about food and flow that I love is that we, there is like all of these lists and it's like, now go through this list and just say, what are you craving? So if it, if, you know, say it is like those bright red, rich, like dark, dark, um, or even better, like during menstruation, those really dark blackberries are like one of the recommended foods, right? So there's a whole list of foods and it's vegetable and it's fruit and it's grain and it's proteins of different sources. And you can go through that and go, oh my God, blackberries are just like screaming at me looking at this list. Well, guess what? That's exactly what you needed. There's something in that vitamin C or the antioxidant richness of it, or there's something in there that your body recognized as a need. So a lot of the times it's not even going, well, I need to eat this specific food because Sasha said so. It's going, I'm going to listen to my intuition and I'm going to listen to my body tell me what it wants. And here's a huge uh, variety of foods that we could choose from. And let's see what works. And this is also something that we're doing in the school. So next year, when the doors open for the school, we're going to take that exact same thing from Food and Flow and put it into the school, and we'll talk about it in there too. Where it's because it's just so important to teach women, not even teach women, but just to give you an effective source of actually listening to, turning into, and trusting your body, because we are definitely taught to mistrust our bodies. Oh, one thousand million percent, we are. So, so there's also something else I wanted to ask you about. You support 
a whole lot of different um, causes just by being the period coach, <laughs> but your business specifically works with an organization. Can you tell us about that? Oh yeah. Days for girls. Yeah. So for two years I did a summit uh, each, well, I did one summit a year for two years in a row. And both of those years, uh, we dedicated any half of the profits to Days for Girls. And then moving forward, um, I've got some other projects in the works that we're kind of taking over for the summit this year because book this year. So I didn't do the summit this year. But <laughs> anyway, whenever there's an opportunity to put something out there where I can donate to Days for Girls, I take it because they work around the world doing two of my favorite things, helping girls get educations and helping girls with periods. So my absolute favorite things is seeing smart ladies out there in the world and a lot of women can't get a full education because of their period. They don't have the monetary resources to get sanitary quote unquote products. Um, I would just rather say menstrual products because uh, there's nothing unsanitary about your period. It's, it's, Okay. Um, but, uh, or they just don't have the resources, right? They might just be in the middle of nowhere and not have a place to even get them from or the resources to make their own at home. So they work around the world in, in, in countries you would expect it. You know, it started in Africa for girls because they couldn't go to school during their periods and would not make it out of high school because they just missed too many days. Mm -hmm. uh, so hence days for girls. It's days in school for girls. That's uh, amazing. But then a byproduct, yeah, it is. But a byproduct of that was that they realized that the girls were being targeted when they're bleeding. There's a lot of myth around uh, a girl who's menstruating um, during the AIDS crisis. And even today in some parts, there's this idea that if you were diagnosed with AIDS, sleeping with a virgin menstruating can cure you. So there's just rape. Uh, comes to be a, a medicinal practice or, um, or it's a time when they know women are being ostracized and being put into a hut or something away from their family. So they'll go pick gr those girls up and sell them as, as sex slaves or in human trafficking. So a lot of these, the, the, these ways for women to have access, in fact, keeps them safe, not just educating them, also is keeping them safe and getting them an education. And it's not just Africa. They work in other countries too. And in the United States where period property is a legit issue, they have communities here too in the U.S. So it's a real worldwide issue for women in, in most countries that they're not getting their proper education because of their periods and lack of resources to deal with it. So I really love what they do. I've talked to their CFO in an interview. I've interviewed their CEO. They're amazing women over there doing this work. They're always making it better. They even help women now start businesses doing menstrual, creating menstrual products like pads and stuff for their communities. So they're even helping women set up businesses. I just, every time they expand, I'm cheering. Yeah, they're incredible. So any opportunity I can go donate to do Days for Girls too. <laughs> Everyone listening, <laughs> go check them out. Exactly. We are so loving all of the good work that people like Days for Girls are doing. It's incredible because yeah. period poverty sucks no matter where in the world you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the risks vary. I mean, I remember hearing actually not long ago that when the earthquakes happened in Nepal a few years back, um, there was so much chaos. And then 10 months afterwards, all of these births started happening because of all of the chaos and everything, you know, a little bit off track, but it just, the vulnerability of being in situations like that, where there is a natural disaster, where there are taboos and myths Mm -hmm. And women are the ones who really suffer it. So yeah, these organizations are amazing for the work that they do. Yeah. Yeah. They're, and they're just incredible. I really, I love the work they're doing and the, and the, you know, their mission behind it. So, and, and I love how they learn, you know, like somebody else could have gotten this critique, like the women aren't using the pads because it looks like pads when they hang them out on the line to dry. And then everyone knows that, that they're bleeding and therefore 
they're unsafe or they're, that taboo has been broken or whatever. And so they won't use them. And rather than going, no, 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 that's not right. They went, okay, so, so how do we fix this? And then, and then they created well, this had already existed, but they started using um, pads where it's a fold. It looks like a washcloth and it's folded and there's a little slip that you put it in that clips around the panties and it's so you can actually wash them and hang them out on the line and they just look like washcloths. So nobody is the wiser. So those women are not unsafe using it. And so rather than like taking this criticism in a negative way, they learned from it and evolved and made it better. And, and that's just, and then they realized different, innovation. different needs. So they did different things for different communities. And I just, I love any organization that can grow like that. You know, I know I'm so on board with it. You also do a very cool thing with your business where you give uh, scholarships as well. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. yeah so uh, a few years ago when I started, oh God, maybe more than a few years ago now. Ooh, time <laughs> we won't specify how long ago. <laughs> okay. So when I started doing Your Business, Your Flow, it's a program for women in business to run their businesses with their cycles, or if they don't have a cycle, they can also join so that they can learn how to help their own clients who have periods because ultimately most of the women that I work with who have businesses work with women, at least in the majority. So it was just a way of educating women so that they were holistically training their clients and also how they could be using it for their own businesses. And uh, I, I did a summit and I was looking for guest speakers for the summit and I was looking for guest speakers for your business, your flow, and I could find no women of color. I was having the hardest time finding uh, indigenous women, black women, any, just women from any other culture than just like white ladies from some kind of Euro based country being Europe or Australia or the U S but you know, just these general Westernized cultures. And, um, I thought, God, we need more women in doing this menstrual work. So I started offering up a free spot in your business, your flow for any woman of culture color who is doing work in the menstrual field. So whatever it is, 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 is loosely blazed, but womb centric work, I was just giving a free spot to. So for every seven women who are paying, I was opening up another free spot for a woman of color to come in, learn how to run her business and flow, learn how to work with her clients with her period, and then also doing this other work as well. So um, it was just an incredible opportunity and that's translating as well into the school that's coming out next year and how we can even expand on that concept and maybe include some sliding scales, some scholarship things in there so that we can make it even more that, you know, it's like, that was great to do one in every seven women got a free spot. But then I know that there are women who can afford to pay something and we could, but maybe not full price. And it's like, how can we just bring more, women of culture, marginalized women, women who just need the extra help. And, and cause I, I mean, I can't go into the same communities that they can go in and I can't be everywhere in the world either. So what? the more diversity <laughs> we get, the better. And the more places in the world we get, the better. And these, the things that we're teaching are ways for these women to pay less, to get more help, to ease the burden to spend less on their periods. Like there's just so many things that could be helping their communities that they're missing out on simply because they don't have somebody who can speak to them, who are there, who are in their communities. And, and I just think that's a freaking shame. So just a way in order to help move this whole movement forward and to help everyone move this because we can't just move a certain socioeconomic group forward. We need everybody, uh, all women around the world to move forward together in tandem. It's the only way it's going to work. So just, Hell yeah. Yeah. Just one of the ways that I can do it. And I'm always open for more suggestions as well. So, you know, if you're listening to this and you have some suggestions, throw them at me because I'm always looking for more suggestions. I love that your business is a form of activism. I think that is fucking brilliant. Yeah. The, the principle, if we're not active and moving forward and changing and helping things move forward for everybody, then what are we doing? Scratching our heads, probably. Mm -hmm. So yep. you are currently at the editing stage, I saw, of your yes. book. Please, please tell us more before we wrap this up because we have to know more about this book. 
Yeah. So it's called The Revolution Will Be Bloody. It's the final frontier of a holistic women's health and, and really the revolution for women. So if you can roll with me on the definition of feminism being equality for all genders across the board. It's not about women getting above. It's not about smushing men down or in any way trying to, you know, it's just, it's not like there's only 12 seats at the board and women can only have one seat at that tape to fight for that one seat seat. It's about seeing a diverse, colorful, genderful board, right? So how can we see diversity and in, in, in all aspects? So if we can all just get on board with that definition of feminism for the moment, it's really about saying, okay, but we still have this huge gaping hole, which is periods, where we still can't talk about it. We still don't have funding. We're just starting to get science to even start studying women all of those studies that women bring to me, like I should be eating paleo because of this X, Y, and Z and it'll burn more fat for men. Those studies were done on men. All those food studies, all those exercise studies, all those work studies, all of everything, how you think, handle stress, all those studies were done on men. Even the studies done on mice were done on male mice. I mean, it's all done on men. Even so, the mice, oh my God. Even the mice. <laughs> So it's, we need to have more of this stuff, which means we need to talk about periods. And at the moment, that means we need to be doing the work. And I, I see this huge gaping void where women are starting to realize that, that hormones, birth control, IUDs, whatever it is, but hormones or these kinds of things or surgery are the only two options that women get. It's birth control or surgery. Those are your options. And 80% of women have a hormonal imbalance at some point in their life. So we're, and the pharmaceutical companies have been very honest that their goal is to have women on hormone replacements from, from cradle to, to coffin. Like they want to have women on some, be very controlled from start to finish. They want to have control over how women feel, think, all of that stuff because that's what hormonal replacement does. And it fattens their wallets. Right. And they make a lot of money doing it. So we need to have these discussions and we need to have women talking to women again. We need to have women going, okay, well, this worked for me. Maybe it'll work for you. It might not. But even if we just have these conversations going, then we can have the conversations and then women know more and then women can give better advice and it snowballs. So we have this gaping void of women who are walking out of their doctor's offices going, that's not right. There's got to be something else. But nobody to fill in that void. And this is where I want this book to help. I want you to be able to read this book and go, oh, that's what I missed. Or for those women that have a sneaking suspicion that there might be more to their period and they've been led to believe, this is, you're going to get that information here. And then even further for those women who want to make a difference, who, or even in just their own lives, but to make a difference, even if it's in their own life or even if it's just for their families or their daughters or sisters or whatever, but to make a, it's even a small scale difference to a huge world changing difference here's where we can start because I'm going to show you the little bits and pieces that you can do in this book. It's got action. It's got suggestions. It's got things to do. It's got, and it's not things that are going to make your life harder or ask you to, to sacrifice, to, to get accomplished. I'm not going to go in there and tell you, I, you can never have this thing. You can never have cupcakes again. That's not, <gasps> I think I'm not going in there that. to tell you that. I'm in there to tell you, you know what? You might want to try adding a chia seed pudding in and then have the cupcake. (laughs) But like, what can we do to actually make ourselves feel better and make that, that ball roll forward? And then how can we help? And it's, it's very much a book of personal help, but also worldwide, hopefully global impact help. You know what I love so much about the book and, and the impact it can have, because it can reach so many people is they often say now that if you want to really help a community, you have to help the women. Mm-hmm. You really want a community to be doing better than you need to empower the women because yep. that's where it begins. It, 
you know, it's the same thing. Like if you want women to be able to work more and be more productive, then you need to help them do that by giving them the childcare, the health care mm-hmm. and the other supports in place. And boom, suddenly really big ripple effects start happening. Yep. And I can just, I'm just thinking about my own family. I've got two younger sisters um, who have both recently started with their bleeds in the last year or so. Um, and I just think from, you know, just within my family, that would be like enormous ripple effects out, you know, eventually they'll go out and start dating and Mm -hmm. find someone. And then the people they interact with, it'll ripple out to them as well. And it's just, ah, Oh yeah. Gives me all the hope. (laughs) It does. I can't tell you when I'm out in the world doing these gigs and I get to meet husbands or partners I, the, they, the partners will take a moment to thank me because it creates more peace in their household because they know. I bet it does. <laughs> right. They know, like they're not blindsided. They understand what's happening. They also get, they know not to bring that stupid subject up today. They know t- that they're going to get laid in a week. Like they just know much better how, what's going on with their beautiful bleeding partner and and how to deal with it and how to manage the household and how to be a better partner and it creates a lot more relief and dare i say it connection Ooh, with now partner. you're getting a bit racy <laughs> yeah it's a good thing right so it's it's incredible to see and there's you know there's definitely like down the line that you know dream of having like the group for men. <laughs> oh, like, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> yeah. You know, like how, how we can do some education, but that's, that's down the line. One, one thing at a time. Let's get to the women first. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I love it. Stasha, thank you so much for all of the juiciness of this. I deeply appreciate it. I know people listening are going to love it. Where can we find you and support you and, do all of the things. Absolutely. So the general Facebook or um, website is theperiodcoach.com. And then if you want more information, usually it's on the front page of the the website, but you can always go to theperiodcoach.com slash Indiegogo for pre-orders of the book for as long as that lasts. Uh, And then of course, we'll just substitute that out for, you know, the next phase of, um, how to get the book. So it'll still take you somewhere for the book. Uh, and then on Facebook, I am slash Stasha Washburn. So you can jump in there. And we also have a Facebook group that's free and open to anyone who identifies as woman, who is comfortable with talking about blood, who is interested in learning more about their menstrual cycles, maybe not quite comfortable talking about blood, but would like to become comfortable. It is. Uh, and it's open to it. Yep. And that's the red circle lady business. So you've done such an amazing job with that group. That is my one. It is probably the one place where I'm like, okay, I can go in here and talk about some really weird stuff that I'm curious about or just piecing together. And honestly, that's where I got my first education about my period. So it is amazing. Yeah, it's a great community and there's always women joining who don't know anything, who are asking those basic questions and there's women that have been in there for years who are talking about more advanced things. So no matter where you are along your journey, and I and this happens regularly where someone will say, I'm sorry, this is probably a stupid question and I just want to say there are no stupid questions in that group. That's literally what the group is for. <laughs> so please come ask your stupid quote unquote questions. <laughs> It's amazing. Thank you so much, Stasha. Hey, if you want to continue this conversation, head over to our Facebook page and be part of the revolution. You can find us at Good Girls Don't Podcast on Facebook. Please note we cannot create change alone. Your support, likes, comments, shares, and iTunes reviews help us to give a voice to the insanely inspirational women and the controversial issues that we discuss. If you'd like to be a part of our podcast or if you have an issue that you have a burning desire for us to bring into the light, please contact us. With fierceness, Ashley and Verity. Verity. 
Get ready for the rain.